Dr. Rakesh Bhattacharji is head of uh, pediatric sleep at University of California, San Diego, and also at uh, Rady Children's Hospital. Okay, thank, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the organizers for uh, having uh, pediatricians speak at this conference. I'm actually the opening actor of Dr. Lagmani, who's presenting after me, so uh, that's so he'll follow me right after. I know we're running on time, so I'll try to be quick. So my focus is mostly on, uh, just specifically on pediatrics, because that's what I see in the clinic, and that's who I treat. And I'm gonna sort of, I'm not a myofunctional therapist, and I'm not a dentist or a surgeon. Um, I'm in fact a respiratory physician um, who has an interest in, in treating sleep disorders. And so, because I'm sort of the, the front line, it's, it's my job to try to, you know, f phenotype patients and, and put them in the right therapy, and it's always a challenge, and I hope uh, in some ways you're going to see how challenging it is. So let's first acknowledge Dr. Gimeno um, for describing pediatric sleep apnea, and for those of you who are attending the conference, there is going to be a, an, an on, an, an, a symposium on him who rec he recently passed away, and he's really, you know, the father of pediatric sleep medicine in a, in a seminal publication in 1976 in which he presented uh, eight children with sleep apnea. Um, you know, this is a disease that was sort of initially described in adults over 100 years ago, but if you look at it in kids, this is only really about 40 years of age, so there's, there's really a lot to, uh, to learn about, and, and, you know, we know sleep apnea, the physiology of sleep apnea, we've sort of covered that uh, to detail in the, in the previous presentations, but what we've learned about kids in the last 40 years is actually quite, it's, it's evolved quite significantly. You know, if you look at that first publication by Dr. Gimeno, uh, it, what we see today in the clinic is not the same as what we're seeing in, in that seminal publication. I'm going to talk about that uh, towards the end of the study, but I, I want to sort of just first acknowledge why is this important. So if you look at the prevalence of sleep apnea, we know there's about 75 uh, million children in the United States. I apologize, it's not Canadian data. This is kind of offensive because I'm actually from Canada myself. <laughs> Um, there's about 37.5 million kids under the age of 9. And if you look at just snoring, which affects 10%, so habitual snoring, snoring you know, consistently about at least three nights a week, we estimate that's about 5 million kids. And if we use stringent criteria such as polysomnography, and if we put kids through the torment of having a sleep study, the incidence that, or the prevalence of sleep apnea is about 2 to 3%. And this is actually pretty conservative, and a lot of that has really reflected in improvements in diagnosis, improvements in recognition, but also a change in, in sort of risk factors that are associated with sleep apnea. But notwithstanding, obviously the biggest contributor to sleep apnea, and this is the, you know, this was very evident in, in, in Christian's publication in 1976, is, is these two bad boys, the, the enlarged tonsils, but also what's not seen in this is the enlarged adenoids. So why is it occurring in children? Well, if you know, if you know what happens in, in, in during sleep, these tissues cause anatomical obstruction of the air, upper airway. And classically, we know that these tissues grow during young childhood. So this is a, was thought to be a disease affecting mostly toddlers. And we didn't think that this disease really affected adolescents that much because as these kids grow, the burden of this obstruction becomes less, and that's mostly related to the, in fact, the growth of the upper airway. Um, uh, Dr. Ono gave some very elegant studies looking at the size of the airway, and he presented this in young rats, but you know, things change for in children, which is really related to the actual growth of the airway. So you will actually hear some parents ask me, like, can my kids outgrow it? And the answer was yes. Uh, I say was because now we're starting to see some kids who may, in fact, not outgrow their obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the differential for diagnosis of sleep apnea, again, number one on this list is adenotonsil hypertrophy, but there is a lot of other um, um, contributors, uh, including obesity, which I'll talk about. But sp specifically to this audience, you know, there's a lot of other factors that limit craniofacial growth that, that can be related to syndromes or genetic conditions, uh, or could be related to things like cerebral palsy. So we have to take into account that it's not just always the soft tissue. It's not always just the... Um, uh, adenal tonsillar tissue, but there might be other factors such as neuromuscular factors, there might be uh, skeletal factors that all might be contributing here. Taken together though, uh, this is a, a, a publication by Carol Marcus who also sadly uh, recently passed away and was also a pioneer in our field uh, where she published guidelines uh, for pediatricians in terms of how to approach these kids that snore and that might have sleep apnea. 
but also how to treat. And the recommendation, even as recent as 2012, is that the first line of therapy should be to take the adenoids and tonsils. If you see these kids, start thinking about prepping them for surgery. Because of that, things have changed. So if you look at the actual incidence of adenotonsillectomy as a surgery, this is actually the third most common surgery in, in, amongst children. Um, it's been, you know, we saw, we've seen a decrease in tonsillectomy, but a huge surge in the last 20 years of adenotonsillectomy. And uh, you can also see that the reason for that, not doing tonsillectomies for recurrent tonsillitis or recurrent infection, we're doing the surgery because of obstructive symptoms. So as sleep physicians, we have a great relationship with our otolaryngologist and vice versa. The otolaryngologists have a great relationship with us because this is a very highly prevalent disease. But let's look into this further. I mean, is this surgery actually effective? You know, ultimately, when you're deciding any type of therapy, whether it be surgery, whether it be positive airway pressure therapy, and whether it be a myofunctional therapy, which I'll talk about, we have to ask ourselves, does this actually work for the child that you're seeing in the clinic that particular moment of time? So the meta-analysis that's been done have all shown consistently that there is a significant improvement in, in symptoms. But... You know, the, the, the challenge for all of these studies, and, and similarly the challenges for th studies with myofunctional therapy, and I think one of the questions I was asked today was, you know, what are you looking as the primary outcome? You know, some people look at sleep studies, some people look at symptoms, some people look at oximetry findings, some people are now looking at mouth breathing. So it's kind of a potpourri of different outcomes, and so it's always challenging to try to put all of this together. Um, so one of my objectives when I was doing a my fellowship with David Gozal at the University of Louisville was to actually look at sleep study data where I could actually look at the apnea hypopnea index. Um, and this is, uh, was a, a project that really involved many uh, investigators, uh, six centers across the United States and two from Europe. And what I show in this pie chart is that the amount of residual sleep apnea after surgery is not trivial. So if you look at an AHI, an apnea hypopnea index over five, which we as clinicians would consider as moderate or severe sleep apnea, so one in five children have that condition following upper airway surgery. If we look at what we think is curative, that you don't have apnea, uh, have sleep apnea, that only occurred in 27%. So clearly the majority of patients following surgery have some degree of residual disease. And so it raises the question, like, does surgery always work in terms of curing disease? And, I, and it's looking more and more like it, but probably not, that as surgeons, they need to start thinking about additional modalities. And that sort of, that publication was followed by probably the most seminal publication recently, which is the Childhood Adenotonsillectomy, or CHATS trial. This is a very powerful study because, number one, it's a multi-center study, previous to the, what I showed before, but this was a randomized prospective study. Um, it was always, it's always been challenging to randomize kids in sleep apnea, because in this case what they did is they randomized them to surgery or no surgery. And I'm also highlighting, look at the number of patients here. This is 464 kids that they actually studied. This is not the 10 or 20 kids, this is a large group of patients. So this is pretty robust data. And there's two really interesting things. Their primary interest or outcome was looking at neurocognitive function, but they were able to look at the efficacy of surgery. And they found that it worked in some patients, but if you had risk factors, it wouldn't always work. So if you look at the dark blue bar, which is the adenotonsillectomy group, you saw that there was a resolution of sleep apnea more prominent in non-obese kids compared to obese. So only 67% of obese kids actually had resolution of their sleep apnea. You found that uh, children of African-American descent also had an increased risk of residual sleep apnea, and children who had more severe sleep apnea also had an increased risk of, of residual sleep apnea. The other thing that actually, the most interesting thing that I find from the study, though, is the watchful waiting group, in that a lot of non-obese kids, a lot of kids with mild sleep apnea, 65%, and a lot of kids who didn't have other racial risk factors actually had normalization of their sleep study following just observation. Now you can always question the study because their, this primary outcome here is the AHI. And you'll see many talks you know, in this audience and then also with my, our adult colleagues that question the utility of the AHI as the primary outcome. But in this case, the, the AHI actually spontaneously re resolved 
without doing surgery, without doing positive airway pressure, without doing appliances or what have you. So when I was asked to write this book chapter, uh, and I have to apologize to Mark, uh, because we looked at uh, treatment of sleep apnea. And as you can see from this, this workflow that, you know, we still think of adenotonsillectomy as our, our first-line therapy. But there's definitely contraindications to surgery, and there's definitely risk factors for residual sleep apnea, such that now we have to think about additional therapies. And positive airway pressure therapy still remains what we think of as next steps, but there are now new emerging therapies, including medications, dental appliances, weight loss, even positional therapy, and a new technology called high flow therapy. Why I have to apologize to Mark is when I was writing this chapter, I did not include oral myofunctional therapy, which has really been a big game changer in the last several years. We have to realize that perhaps getting, instead of prescribing CPAP devices, maybe we should be prescribing the didgeridoo uh, to our patients, because this actually might be a, uh, a useful way to, to improve sleep apnea. So what's the premise for this? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, this is kind of repetitive for what the previous speakers have spoke about, but we have to think about sleep apnea as a combination of inflammatory tissue, but also balancing between the development of bone and tissue. And we just learned about how relevant intermittent hypoxia might disturb normal growth and development. But nonetheless, it's starting to raise the question, because of the impact of bone, because of the impact of muscle, we have to question whether surgery is sort of the next best step. And I know uh, uh, Joy sitting in, this, uh, in the audience here, and I'm going to just read this. I apologize if I don't read it as eloquently as you do. But um, this is from her um, a very interesting um, article that I highly recommend. That She says that the removing tonsils and adenoids did not always change the breathing pattern from oral to nasal, especially in the long term. And in, in such case, a myofunctional therapist may be needed to assist the child in retraining the function of the tongue and breathing, chewing and swallowing, and to eliminate maladaptive oral habits. So this sort of introduced a whole new paradigm of where sleep apnea may not in fact necessarily be under the domain of an ENT surgeon. We might now start thinking about other avenues to explore. But the question as a, you know, in clinical medicine is we have to really look at the evidence. Are we there yet to really think that this is sort of the big game changer? And so I want us to just kind of spend the, the, the remainder of the talk talking about what the evidence suggests. And I know Mark showed this uh, before. This was a, uh, a nice um, uh, publication led by Cleet Kushida looking at now the utility of myofunctional therapy for which they had two pediatric studies that met inclusion for their analysis. But I highlight that there's only 25 patients in those two studies. Now compare this to the CHAT study, which had 484 studies. This is a very, very small sample size, okay? Uh, they did find that there was an improvement in the AHI, which was their primary outcome, which was uh, very exciting, um, such that there, if you do look at this from a relative improvement, there was a 62% improvement in, in, in AHI. And the authors sort of concluded that myofunctional therapy, they didn't say that it could be the first line of therapy, but they did recommend that it could be used as an adjunct to treat sleep apnea. So in this case, have the kids go through surgery, but use myofunctional therapy in addition to further improve the AHI. So that's sort of been the scope of some of the initial studies. So if you look at this one paper uh, back from 2013 that was led by, by Christian Gimeno, this was a multi-center study. It was retrospective, so you have to worry about bias. Um, there were 24 subjects. All of these were non-obese. 14 were referred for oral myofunctional therapy, for which 11 actually were compliant and three were not. And then they had 13 controls. And they actually looked, what was nice about the study is they looked long-term. So they looked actually two to four years following. And you can see if their primary outcome is the AHI, you saw that those patients who got before surgery had an AHI of 10. And then they were left with mild disease, 4.3 events per hour. And if they had re-education or myofunctional therapy, they, um, they the, their, the AHI remained reduced at 0 0.5 events per hour, whereas if they did not have myofunctional therapy, they actually had a worsening of their AHI. So that, was con that suggests in this first study that there might be sort of this long-term beneficial effect through retraining of, 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 uh, of the muscles that are involved in protecting the, the upper airway. Uh, the next uh, group of studies came from Maria Pia Village's group in, in Italy, and this was nice because now we're looking at prospective study designs. Um, here they looked again following surgery if they had residual OSA based on uh, an AHI over one. 
And they compared, now again, 14 patients to control patients. And uh, they, they were blinded in looking at the evaluation, and they actually did repeat the sleep study as well. And what you can see is group one is the myofunctional group, and group two is the non-myofunctional group. Both patients started out with severe sleep apnea. Both groups had their, uh, their tissue, their adenotonsor tissue taken out. But in the group that had myofunctional therapy, there was actually a further enhancement or improvement in the AHI compared to those that didn't. That, that's the mean. And you can see that there's obviously some patients that had very, very robust responses, some that didn't. And you can also see that there was one patient that had a robust re response in the, in the non-myofunctional group, but most of them were stable or, in fact, worse, got actually worse. So this does support the, the actual fact that we should be thinking about this treatment, um, at least post-surgically. Um, then uh, Dr. Gamino and, and his group looked at a higher, uh, larger po population uh, from their, their first publication, where again they looked at uh, uh, patients with residual sleep apnea, and here they looked at 27 kids, and um, they had nine months of just six months of, of therapy as opposed to the two to four years, and from that they actually found that the group that received only six months of therapy had a significant reduction in the AHI compared to the non-myofunctional group. Again, this is another post-surgical um, study where they, they uh, augmented um, treatment via myofunctional therapy. But now the other question that sort of emerges is, could we look at just even pre-surgery? Is this an actual treatment option for patients if, you know, if we don't have to throw them in the operating room? And this is a study from uh, Maria P. Villa that looked at that, um, where they randomly assigned patients to myofunctional therapy or no myofunctional therapy. And you know, in terms of some of the symptoms such as oral breathing and tongue posturing and lip hypotonia, there was all improvements, but they didn't really find major improvements in the indices from polysomnography. So they talked about a mean oxygen saturation increasing from 96.4 to 97.4%. As a pulmonary physician, I wouldn't be so excited by that. I think those, because those are both normal values. The oxygen desaturation index decreasing from 5.9 to 3.6 is a little bit more exciting, uh, but it still does suggest that, you know, th first of all, that this might have been a mild group that they may have started out with. So using myofunctional therapy first line may be not something that you'd use for the severe sleep apnea maybe those kids that had mild sleep apnea, because clearly if they had severe sleep apnea, we might think more in terms of um, surgical um, options. Uh, there was a study that was published in the International Journal of Pediatric Otolaryngology, uh, um, where they, you know, even if you just looked at patients with sleep apnea versus primary snoring, you could already tell that these patients right off the get-go have myofunctional impairment, and there's a, definitely a, perhaps a need to start the therapy. And so when I look at this paper, uh, part of me thinks that, okay, if, if, if I see this and I know they have big tonsils, there's no reason why not to start this therapy before the surgery is done because there's definitely things that could be worked on early. So now, we was brought up in the, in the, recent, the previous uh, uh, presenter, this notion of passive versus active myofunctional therapy, which I think is going to be pretty important to look at. And this is from, from Dr. Gamino's publication, Pediatric Sleep Apnea, Where Do We Stand?, where he states that the major problem with active over myofunctional therapy is compliance with daily exercises and continuous parental involvement with the training exercises of the child. We saw some elegant videos to, to, to do at home, but I always wonder, are children really going to be doing that when they have a Nintendo Switch in front of them? But we have to figure out how to get these kids to actually do this regularly. And if you look at all types of studies, when we enroll patients that want to try new things, those are always the motivated, encouraged patients. It's like the healthy user effect. But in real life, even if we're talking about positive airway pressure, these patients don't necessarily do these therapies at home. And so this was raised by Dr. Gimeno, and I think it's a very valid concern. And he also discussed this notion of these of passive myofunctional therapy, in which you use a device um, to actually engage in myofunctional training. And um, at that time, there wasn't a lot of publications on this, and so it was sort of a relatively novel idea, but there are now publications on this. So, in fact, Dr. Gamino published one, and this was presented in the previous presentation, where there's 29 kids with sleep apnea. Interestingly, he, he dichotomized patients between, with full-term and preterm um, infants. 
And he showed that there was a significant improvement in this device, which engaged in myofunctional therapy, where the AHI went from 5.4 to 1.9. Again, small number, though. There's only 29 patients. The group that used the Myobrace device has recently published a study. Uh, I was unfortunately not able to access this article. Um, I hope maybe some dentists have looked at this and I'm happy to speak to them about this. But they used a short course of this oral appliance for 90 days. And what I couldn't see was the actual quantitative improvements in the AHI, but they said that there was a significant reduction in the AHI using that device and also an improvement in the oxygen saturation. Uh, they didn't see, and they saw an improvement in the oxygen saturation but it wasn't statistically significant. But this did reveal promise that even in a small sample size of nine patients, they actually had a significant reduction in the AHI. I was recently uh, able to get data from the Healthy Start group, uh, who is a group that we were collaborating with in San Diego, uh, where they actually took a large amount of patients using their device, 220 patients. Again, this is an appliance that's looking at posturing, but also engaging in myofunctional therapy. And using the Healthy Start survey, they found round-the-clock improvements in symptoms of mouth breathing and snoring um, just using a, a course of about 6.4 months of this appliance. So this is very promising emerging data that is now advocating for the use of appliances to engage in myofunctional therapy. And given that this might be easier to track and might be a little bit better with compliance, I think this might be something that we might talk about more in the future. Now, just one more thing. Um, now, I'm not here to talk about the new iPhone 11, but I'm here to talk about the other risk factor here, which is obesity. Obesity is a big deal in our clinic, because if you look at Dr. Guillemino's study, uh, that was eight kids who are non-obese. Most of the patients that I see in my clinic today are obese. They might have enlarged tonsils, they're still obese. That's really the reflection of the obesity endemic that's in the United States. And in that study that I published, um, looking at the eight centers that uh, pre and post surgery, we found that obesity was a significant risk factor for residual sleep apnea. So what do we do about these kids? And what, what, when we look at myofunctional therapy, do we know enough about myofunctional therapy and obesity? There really isn't a lot of studies tackling this in this population. Um, and so we really need to phenotype these patients first and try to figure out which is the best strategy to treat these patients. You know, uh, you know, I always get questions about how do you guys do weight loss in your clinic. We actually don't really do a good job of weight loss. It remains one of the most challenging conditions uh, in pediatrics to treat. Um, so given that, what's the best way to treat these patients? And so we really need to thematically, we need to think about issues of compliance, but we also need to think about risk factors that, that include in our clinic that matter when we, when we treat these patients. So just to kind of conclude, I, I hope I was able to, to to show that you know this is a very common condition, sleep apnea, and very much so the etiology is multifactorial. And the question is that I, I hope we uncover with our research group is that is myofunctional therapy appropriate for every child? And if it's not, what's the best way to phenotype these patients? We know that surgery is first line still, and we know now that it's not uniformly effective. And given that it's not uniformly effective, I think the studies are very strongly supportive that myofunctional therapy does have a role here in to at least deal with that population. But again, we don't know about the kids who are overweight. And then finally, I think the last question that I think is very exciting is this notion that is oral myofunctional therapy more effective through appliances versus exercises from a pragmatic approach? If you're going to suggest this in your clinic, what's the best way to do this? And it would be nice to look at a cross comparison between the appliances versus actual active exercises to see which patients actually respond long term. And on that note, I'm, I'm happy to finish my opening act for Dr. Lagmani, who is presenting next. Mm -hmm. yeah.